ghosts moving around. <laughs> there we there go. You go. You like one of them palm trees, man. <laughs> <laughs> nah, we'll keep it regular. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Showtime TV. I'm your host, Omar Rashida. Today's topic of discussion is a very important topic. We've got so many people that do it. They do it well. Entrepreneurship. I got some distinguished guests here. Oh, man, he's some big shots. I got Dave, Tanisa, Fernando, Ventina. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for being a guest on tonight's show. All right, so let's start off with, with Dave. Um, I want each one of you to just introduce yourselves. Um, let's talk about your business and how you come about being an entrepreneur. We'll start off with Dave. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Mays, licensed Delaware real estate agent and owner of Icon DJs, a full service entertainment company and photo booth company. Uh, how did I get my start? I've been a serial entrepreneur since I was a kid. I grew up in West Philly and at the age of eight, my grandmother gave me an ice cream maker for uh, Christmas one year. And we took that and I made flyers on the old school word processor, maybe I'm telling my age. And we sold ice cream all summer until I got enough money to accompany her to California and pay my own way to Disneyland. Uh, since that time, I knew entrepreneurship was for me. Uh, I've gone to the University of Delaware with a degree in biology that I don't use, uh, but the, the resources and folks that I connected with at UD uh, outside of my personal curriculum have really gave me a nice springboard uh, to run my businesses. Um, I'm here to talk about dual careers, dual entrepreneurship. A lot of people think that when you're an entrepreneur, uh, you're just gonna focus on one industry, one product, one service. That's not always true. I mean, we're coming out of pandemic. Uh, let's be realistic. DJing has been in, in, in the tank for a, a year and a half at the least. And the only thing that kind of saved grace for me was real estate during that time. Now, DJs, DJing has come back since then with, with the opening of and, and the, least, and, and the uh, reduction of restrictions. Uh, but, you know, being a, a serial entrepreneur, uh, if you do it right, it's, it, it can be a really rewarding uh, aspect. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. All right, well, welcome. Oh, welcome. That's awesome. You know, that's a great point that you made about having more than one business, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking just this one particular type of business. But, but if you got the flexibility and the talent to do more than one, hey, that, that's what's up. All right, Tanisa, talk about it. Next. <laughs> All right. So good evening. And first, thank you, Omar, for the opportunity to be on tonight's show with these distinguished guests. Again, my name is Tanisa Priester and I um, support nonprofits. Uh, my goal is to help nonprofits raise more money to serve more clients. And I do that through my business, Thai Enterprise. Unlike maybe some of the other entrepreneurs, I currently have my W-2, which is my nine to five. And then I do the business as a part-time business at this moment with the goal to grow it into a full-time venture. But I think my perspective can definitely add value to those who are looking at growing a business while they maintain their nine to five and how they can do that. Um, for me, I got into entrepreneurship by way of a call, a mentor. I went to graduate school in Omaha, Nebraska, and I had come home to St. Louis, Missouri. And my mentor from Omaha called me one day and said, hey, Tanisa, I have this opportunity um, and I need somebody in St. Louis to be my boots on the ground and work on this grant funded project for me. Do you have your business set up? I was like, uh, no, Paul, but guess what? In a month, it'll be all together, right? So I was kind of pushed into it 
by virtue of that call. But the reality is all my life, I've seen entrepreneurship from my dad and my mom. They both had businesses. So it was only a matter of time that I will follow that line as well. And additionally, I will say this before I turn it back to Omar. I think for those who are considering businesses, think about the thing that people ask you to do all the time and see if that's a way that you can turn it into a money making business venture for you. For me, it was always grant writing. It was always nonprofit advice. It was always fundraising. So I took all those things that I love to do and that people were willing to pay me for and turned that into this leg of my business journey. And like Dave, I too will be a serial entrepreneur with multiple opportunities because we're diverse people. Why not have multiple opportunities to help us grow and maintain a lifelong legacy and lifestyle that meets our needs? Awesome, awesome. Uh, speaking of multiple businesses, Fernando, I know, I know you have about five, six, eight of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, some of these stories, some, hearing some of uh, your stories and how you got started, uh, Dave and uh, uh, Tanisha. Yep. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, kind of similar to my story. You know, I grew up uh, with entrepreneurship in my family as well. My father and my uncle had a promotion business, uh, I would say, back in the uh, 70s, early 80s. I uh, call Golden Fleece Production, which Feliciano is my last name, so Golden Fleece. I was too young to actually be involved, but I did hear it a lot. And I got older, I started to understand what was going on with it. Um, they were doing a promotion to company where they were uh, doing business uh, parties and promoting uh, business, uh, pro excuse me, promoting businesses, um, um, excuse me, promoting parties, excuse me. And um, so it was in my blood. Um, but my first crack at uh, entrepreneurship actually came from uh, Howard High School. When I, when I was in Howard, uh, we had a, a program called BPA, Business Professionals of America. And um, I was in that program and they had, uh, they were selling candy uh, for fundraising. And they said, for those people that fundraise, when you, you know, whoever sells the most candy will have their whole uh, trips paid for because we would go to different conferences and have the trips paid for because, you know, you were the top seller. Well, during my two years there, I was the top seller on both occasions. And I uh, got to the point where uh, after I did that, people were still asking me for candy around the, <laughs> around the school. So I wound up doing my own thing. I got me some gum, packs of gum and candy. And then I just started selling it. And um, that's when it really kind of was like, man, this is, you know, this is good. I was able to, you know, pay for lunch money. You don't have to worry about giving me no lunch money. I got it. So it, it was a good experience there. And then it, it graduated after I graduated from high school. Uh, my brother and my cousin, uh, Dave, you know, Miguel, uh, we started a, a promotion company called MDE, Millennium Dynasty Enterprises, Inc. And we started promoting uh, uh, social events, just like my father and my uncle. Uh, we started promoting um, from that started uh, back in 2000, uh, sorry, maybe 90, 99, I believe was our first event. And um, we you know uh, dealt with the likes of Christian Cultural Arts Center, uh, the Waterworks, I'm going to be showing my age. Some of you people don't know Waterworks used to be in a, a place where you can have dinner and, and a nice uh, social uh, event. Now I think it's like a, a, a belongs to the state. Uh, Pharaohs, uh, now so celebrations. We did Latin night there. So, you know, this is this point. We ran this to about maybe like 2012. Um, and right now, currently, just to speed it up a little bit, I am. As Dave said, which I've said it before on this show before, I am a serial entrepreneur. Um, and also uh, to piggyback on what, uh, what she said as well is that I do work a nine to five as well. So I am a W2, but I do have two uh, network marketing businesses that I'm, I'm currently on, on have and uh, with uh, Connect and the other one is Meluca. I'm sure a lot of people know about Meluca. So, um, you know, I'm very diverse and you, you do have to find the time to do it, but eventually my, it's, I can see myself going part-time on my uh, with my W two and going full time with the two business ventures that I have, and with this uh, experience, it allowed me to connect and meet with a lot of people, um, and you know provide services that are uh, essential with Connect with energy and wireless, and um, to also provide health and health from the health company Mel Luca to give people uh, you know especially with the pandemic, it was really tough out here to try to get uh, uh, hand sanitizer and things of that nature. Our company never missed a beat. We actually supplied the government with uh, hand sanitizer. And let me say it's plant-based, 97% of it was plant-based sanitizer, which, you know, you, you, a lot of that stuff is it throw oil and it hurts. It, it really harm, does more harm than it does actually uh, good to your body, the hand sanitizer out there now. 
So I was proud to be able to give those services to people that were in need of it. Um, and uh, I'm working on another venture now that's coming into uh, manifestation and I'm praying on it every day. Um, I'm going to go into the nonprofit, nonprofit uh, sector with a company called Team. Uh, together, everyone achieves more. And it's based out of uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and it's starting to expand uh, into Elkton and Delaware. Actually, we already have a division in Delaware, but I'm going to be uh, helping with uh, start up the uh, program in, uh, in uh, Maryland. And I'll just give you a brief overview and I'll be finished. So it's, it's dealing with uh, behavior and mental health uh, for, for the youth in, uh, in particular, but we also do uh, handle substance abuse for the adults because a lot of times, you know, mental health from kids or just them having situations come, come from the parents maybe being on a drug or substance abuse or that type of uh, nature. So we're looking to expand that as well, uh, hopefully to have that up and running by August and September, which would divert, uh, which would probably allocate majority of my time and get me out of this. I call it a nine to five rat race. I like my job, but it's the rat race. I mean, I'm giving them eight hours. I can be giving myself these eight hours. Um, so just a little brief story uh, about what I'm doing and all the, the dual opportunities that are being presented and what I have currently working. Awesome. All right, Tina Brinkley Potts, go ahead, it's you up, it's your turn. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for having me. I'm Tina Brinkley Potts, and I'm a business strategist, online marketing trainer, and success coach. Um, I, I actually was off for a lot during the pandemic. Um, you know, the pandemic was rough on my family, so I took time to, to really nurture um, my family instead of doing all the things that, uh, that I could do. However, um, I've been in business for myself or working as a independent contractor now for probably more than 20 years. I haven't been a W-2 for a long, long, long time. Um, and I applaud everybody who is a W-2 employee, but um, I, I, I don't have that. And the reason for me was always, it always went back to my family. When I started my businesses, I actually started them because my mother kept having heart attacks and strokes. And so you know how it is when you're on a job, but yet you're like, you don't want to have to keep making the choices of, am I taking care of my family or am I going to punch this clock? And, um, you know, no one could ever complain about my work ethic, the work, the anything, but they could complain if I wasn't coming to work. <laughs> and normally I wasn't coming to work because my family needed me and I refused to pick my job over my family. So because of that, um, I started my own businesses. I have viewers in more than 70 countries. I've had more than 5 million hits to my website. Um, I, last year, I do a lot in sales and marketing automation. Last year, um, I was the rookie of the year for Keep. I am the only Black person to do that. Um, so I've been doing this thing for a minute. Yeah, awesome. I want to stay with you, Tina. And if, you want to, if you, anyone else want to chime in, they can. Uh, I guess one of the first things when, when you're looking to start your own business is, is to develop a business plan. Um, what is a business plan? What does it look like? Well, I think a business plan looks different than it used to look 20 years ago. And I think, I think people really need to understand that. Um, your business plan technically should be everything, like what's going to happen in that client journey, what you're going to do from beginning to end to run your business. And a lot of times people don't think of it that way. You know, in the old days, we used to think of like the SWOT analysis and who's your competition and all of that kind of stuff. Well, today it really should be more about um, who are you going to serve? How are you going to serve? And really looking at that from beginning, how do you um, get the audience and attract the audience? How do you turn it into a lead? And then from there, how do you convert it into a sale? Um, I think that because business plans don't really reflect that, a lot of people are kind of stuck um, when it comes to getting started in business. But that is really what you should do. Look at the client journey. 
Anyone else want to chime in? Or? Well, I would agree with Tina and a lot of with what she said. I do think there is a place for a little bit of that kind of historical information, um, just looking at the environment for which you're in. So a little bit of SWATs, but not to the extent to Tina's point that it was years and years ago. Um, I do think that what is what is relevant, what I do when I work with people starting nonprofits or working along their journey is to think about your one year plan. What does that look like from start to finish? What do you want to accomplish in this year? And how will you reach those milestones? And with that, that includes that client journey. How are you going to reach your clients? How will you uh, recruit them? And then once you get them, how will you serve them? Because business, whether you're nonprofit or for-profit, it's all about service, right? How will you serve them? How will you give them that that interaction that allows them to tell others that it was good for me to have been with this company because of how they treated me or how they resolved my issue, right? And then after you do that, how will you rinse and repeat? And then how will you, of course, continue to secure more sales or secure more clients to keep you in business? So I do think a business plan is necessary, but it has to be something that is relevant to where you are. There's a great gentleman, Jim Haran, who had a one-page business plan which I think is, is a great tool. And you can take your own little riff off of that where you think about your mission and vision. You think about, hey, if I'm gonna serve clients in this first year, what will it cost to do that? And how will I get the investment to, um, so, to serve those clients? And then to Tina's point, what will that journey look like? And how will I then rinse and repeat so that I can serve more people? Oh. I was gonna say uh, to, to echo that, a business plan is really a roadmap. It's really where you want to go and how you're going to get there. So all of those things that the ladies have mentioned are important, but you also want to plan for an exit strategy. Is this a business that you want to do forever? Is this a business that you hope to sell off to a larger competitor or a, an, an investor that might want to take it to the next level? Uh, a lot of people get caught up in that and that they don't plan for the exit. And that's as important as the entrance is to know where you're going. So if you look at the business plan as a roadmap, I think it kind of changes your perspective and, and maybe changes how you approach your business plan also. Absolutely, absolutely. Well said. So I'm gonna take it a little, little, little different here because I, I deal with network marketing and with network marketing, um, the good thing about it is when you when you consider one of these opportunities, the business plan is already established. Um, you just have to have the mindset for it. You have to have the, your reason why you want to do this this this, uh, this, this opportunity, um, and that, and that why has to be stronger than your excuses. So, for those people who may say, "Well, you know, what uh, you know, I maybe." I'm not, you know, I don't, not real business savvy like that, but I want to try to, you know, my hand at entrepreneurship, I would recommend some, a network marketing company that's, 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 you know, solid and it's been around for a while because they have a duplicatable system. You may not be able to write a business plan, but you might be able to follow directions or teach yourself, you know, or, or self teach yourself or follow directions well, and then learn how to, how to duplicate the uh, system that's there. Um, so if your why is strong enough, and you know you want to have an opportunity where you can generate some income uh, residually. That's the reason why I got started in the opportunity is because, um, as Dave said, you know you have to have an exit strategy. Or, you know, I'm doing this business to generate income to do some of the things, some other opportunities that I want to do. Real estate is one of them. I'm actually starting to get touched down in that. I'm in right now it's the negotiation and uh, buying, uh, buying and investing in some properties at this time. So it's starting to come in. But the income that I that I got from uh, network marketing because it's a residual based income. Good thing about network marketing is there's not a low, there's, there's a, uh, the over, the, the, there's not a high overhead. It's a low overhead because it normally takes it's one time to, it's a one time fee to get in. And then at that point you maintain, a, you may maintain a monthly obligation that should be, that's affordable for most. And once you start building this opportunity, you'll start getting residual income for what you did in the past, present, um, and then so on and so on. So it rose that way. So network marketing is, you know, it has a bad reputation um, 
you know, overall. But uh, one thing that I, I do know from experience that it, it is definitely an opportunity for you to make a residual income and allow you to maneuver uh, where you want to go. And like you said, maybe this, you know, I can see myself maybe in a year or two saying, okay, network marketing, you know, I'm going to take that. I'm going I'm to I'm I'm go ahead and take a break from that. Guess what? I still get paid while I take that break. Now, you know, it might lessen because I might lose a little bit of customers. Somebody might, somebody in my leg or somebody in my business that may take a break as well or drop off, but I'm still getting a residual income to where I can be able to fund some other joint ventures or, or ventures or joint ventures that I'm looking to do. So, um, Network marketing um, is definitely something that's still relevant. Bill Gates, he, uh, you know, I'm quoting Bill Gates. He said, if he can start all over again, network marketing would be some, will be uh, a way that he would look to make his money. Um, and that was something that he quoted and it stuck with me as well. I'm reaping the benefits. And again, you know, you meet a lot of people through this journey as well from all different states. That's part of it. It builds a cult. It's a culture that you can build as well. When I go out to, uh, you know, to the conventions and things like that, I meet so many people from different locations take information and we build, you know, and stay in touch with each other. I got a guy that we share the same last name. He's out in, uh, in uh, excuse me, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We're not related, but, you know, I met him at the uh, conference. We still stay in touch. We, you know, we build up with each other and we do things that way. So for those people that really, you know, don't have, uh, you know, how can I get started in a business? And, and I don't have a lot of information and knowledge. If you can follow a duplicatable system, you know, and you have the desire and will to do it, you can be successful. You know, I want to throw this question in the air. Um, someone is contemplating starting a business. And they're thinking about whether or not they should be an LLC, a sole proprietor, or a nonprofit. How will he or she go about deciding what's best for their business? Anybody can tackle that. <laughs> I'll speak at once. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Well, I think it really um, has to be about what you think your the overall mission is. So nonprofits were created to do charitable work, to do endeavors that are best suited for government funding, um, individual funding, and so forth. The goal of a nonprofit is to allow the, re, the profit, because nonprofits can make a profit, but to allow the surplus to go back into the community for which you, for which you serve versus an LLC or an S Corp or a traditional corporation, wherein the profit goes to the shareholders or the owners, the members and so forth. So I think if you're thinking about your nonprofit, you need to think about, is this um, idea fundable? Do other people want to fund what you're talking about? So most recently I spoke with someone who wanted to do a shelter and they were thinking about doing a for-profit shelter. So I had to ask the questions, if it's a for-profit, and you need to make sure you have the people paying enough money in order to cover your mortgage, do you think people who are homeless are gonna be able to afford to pay you for rent what you need to cover your mortgage? Will they be able to pay what you would need in order to provide you with the uh, monies necessary to market your business and so forth? And the answer of course was no, because these are people who are definitely in need. So in that example, there are, foundations and other sources established to meet that need. So a nonprofit is probably the better area. So I definitely think about is your area fundable from the um, government or other sources? Is it a charitable need? Are you meeting a community need that um, draws your target audience as well as funding sources? And um, is it allowable through the tax, through the IRS standards for tax exemption. So those would be three things I would encourage people to consider before they move forward with nonprofit versus for-profit. I, I think would, what I would- oh, go, go, go ahead, Tina, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I think what I would add to that would be um, consider where your funding is gonna come from exactly as she said but then also consider how you wanna be taxed. You know, I can tell you, I know a lot of people who form LLCs and they do not understand how they're gonna be taxed with an LLC. So for mm. instance, if you form an LLC and you are a sole proprietor or you're doing it under a partnership, you know, the difference between a passive income versus a non-passive like playing self-employment taxes, like understand how you're going to be taxed before you make a decision. 
most people make decisions on their business structure based on what they heard other people say. Um, and that is actually the very wrong way of deciding how to pick what kind of business structure you're going to do. Um, uh, we talked about being a multi-entrepreneur, right? Like having different ventures. Do you know when you have different ventures, you really actually might want to explore having different structures because one of them can technically be passive income. See, this is where we get into overpaying taxes and not really understanding. Like um, I say, hate the player, you know, whatever that saying is, don't hate the game. When you're looking at an Amazon who didn't pay no taxes, but yet they generated like a trillion dollars worth of revenue, it's because they understand the tax laws and tax structures. And so, um, you literally have the benefit of some of these tax laws based on the structure you decide. So to me, that should be the most important thing. Understanding how, like, while a lot of people just don't care about paying 20% into taxes or 38% or whatever it is for federal plus state, um, but some people would rather, instead of paying taxes, be able to deduct expenses and then put that money back into their business. And so understanding that is really how you should go forward when it comes to um, a, a structure for your business. Well said, well said. Hey, uh, both, both of those are good. And, <laughs> both, you know, both of you ladies have much more acumen on the nonprofit side than I do. So I'll just speak on what I know. Um, I, I wanna just talk about saving grace. You know, if, if you decide that you wanna go in business and maybe you have a product or service that you work on your own, um, you, could be, you could do an LLC and the saving grace in that is that if you expand or you, your, your business plan or your business structure changes, you could convert to a different, an S corp, a C corp, and things like that. So you definitely want to learn the differences. Um, but you know, an LLC gives you a little bit more flexibility than some of the other uh, entities that are available. And one thing I want to talk about: we're in Delaware. Uh, I'm not sure how many states have adopted this now, but Delaware, last time I checked, was one of the only states that allows for a series LLC. If no one's heard of that, a series LLC, you have a company, you can have up to 99 other companies in series. So you have your company here, you may have another company, another company, another company. They are unrelated. You do not commingle your money. You have separate business plans, separate banking accounts, separate everything, but your formation fees and, and corporate annual corporate fees with the state or if you keep that one company uh, you know, up to date, then those others are, are there too. So if you're someone who likes to try different um, industries or, or different companies and ideas, a series LLC may, may, may work for you in that it, it gives you a little less, um, little less exposure to you know, money and expenses versus setting up each company and paying those formation uh, and, and corporate taxes from the beginning. So every year, you know, I have a DJ company. I'm DJ Amaze, but I also have a general DJ company. I have DJs who work under me. Well, I fly internationally to DJ. So I don't want to use my regular DJ company for the things that I'm doing personally that really have nothing to do with my, my, in my DJ company that encompasses, you know, my employees. So that company is in series with my general DJ company so that I'm not paying two uh, formation or two, two, two fees every year on a company. I'm just paying for the one, uh, but I can conduct business and, and be with well within my rights of the law. That's just an example. But uh, the idea is just that either way, you have to educate yourself. There's lots of resources out there. You can go to sba.gov. Uh, you can get a mentor there. Uh, you know, you can, you can talk to a lot of folks and find out uh, what might be the best structure for you and why? And if I can just pinpoint something that Dave mentioned. Delaware has been notoriously known for its um, 
lucrative business structures and how it's really been a business friendly kind of state. And for those who are watching this who may not live in Delaware, the beauty of this, and I'm sure this is with other states too, is that you can choose to register your business in Delaware. And if you don't live here, you can have a registered agent that um, is the person that is accountable for you in this state so that you can take advantage of these kinds of benefits. So as Dave mentioned, and as Tina mentioned, it's always all about the knowledge. The more you know, the, be the, way, the better you are to equip yourself for success. Like Tina's talking about these tax breaks and all these kinds of things. It's because someone knew to ask the right questions or knew who to connect with in order to get what they needed to position themselves in the best way. Yeah. And that's correct. Everything everybody talked about was right on point. Delaware is known as, as the banking uh, capital of the United States. And the reason why is because, as you mentioned, the, the breaks in the registration. You, Google has a re Google is their headquarters is in Washington, but Google has a, a, a small a registration building here in Delaware just for those purposes, the benefits of being, uh, you know, the benefits and what have you of, of having a business. And it's a lot of them like that. That's like that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, Tina, I want to start off with Tina, if anyone else want to chime in. Um, there are those, uh, let me let me get a scenario. John Doe wants to start a business. He needs $10,000. He doesn't have good credit, <laughs> you know, to, to get a loan. So, I mean, what, what resources out there for those who want to start a business that, that may need some financial assistance in, you know, starting a business? Wow. So, he has $10,000, wants to start a business, and his credit is shot. Um... Well, the first thing I'm going to say is learn how to sell. Most business owners go out of business, be not because of funding, what they think is the problem. It really is because they don't know how to sell because a lot of them will still get funding and never really return revenue. So the business will, like the funding is just a timber, temporary relief from an inherent problem. Mm. So um, I would say learn how to sell whatever your product or service is and learn how to sell it in your sleep. That would be the first thing that I would do. And then the next thing I would do is I would say, put up a landing page and start running ads because after you learn how to sell, then the next thing you could do is make sales. Most people are looking for someone to match that money when you can actually match that money yourself and then own your company 100% instead of having to give some of it away. Now, there are all kinds of reasons why I feel that people should take on investors and of course, and, 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 and uh, get money and go find money. But at the end of the day, it is just... Um, stringing out a problem if you don't know how to sell. Right. That is awesome. You know, uh, Tina and Fernando, you, you, you made uh, two points earlier. You said that you work your entrepreneur jobs part-time. Uh, so at what point do you two believe that you're gonna move from part-time to, to, to working your dream job on a full-time basis? What, what has to happen? Fernando, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, you have to have an exit strategy, as Dave mentioned. And um, my exit strategy is actually probably going to be around September. I would say maybe the, uh, September or the last quarter of 2021 um, or, as, or, or later will be the first quarter of 2022. Um, there are some things in the pipeline right now that are uh, that we're working out, but it all depends on the growth and how fast things happen. Um, again, with this team program, um, it seems to be very promising. Um, I had met the vice president on June 4th, excuse me, the president on June 4th of the team program based in um, Baltimore, Maryland. And I showed him around Elkton and um, he, he likes what he see. He, he wants to um, get, get that started. So right now we're actually laying the foundations down to get, uh, to get that thing up and running. Uh, once that happens, uh, I think the, uh, the ideal time is gonna be uh, August, September. Once we uh, pick that up there, I can see me transitioning rather quickly. Um, to maybe part time at my full time job, part time at my nine to five and full time there, uh, and then eventually just, you know, as a as we say in the in the, in the network marketing has been inspiring our boss. Um, <laughs> so that's the exit strategy I have in place. Um, my two um, my two uh, multi level marketing uh, businesses, 
you know, they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, it was tough during the COVID because um, normally we conduct business, we say kneecap to kneecap, face to face. So we had to transition online, uh, Zoom meetings and, and call and change the way that we, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we uh, uh, expose our opportunity in businesses. But it's been successful. We're starting to pick up now with everything opening up. But I, I'm saying the uh, last quarter of 2021, early quarter, uh, early quarter, first quarter of 2022, is uh, my exit date from the nine to five. All right, Tina. Tina is already full time, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Oh, I'm sorry, Tanisha, I'm sorry, Tanisha, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. So no, in this case, um, it's funny, my husband and I, we were just talking about that. So he and I, we meet routinely about our goals and our vision. And um, he knows that I appreciate my W-2, but he also knows that I'm, 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 I'm ready to hey, make that move for a variety of reasons. So we are actually looking at um, putting that vision to place in 2022 as well. So probably toward the end of 2022, but that's the goal. But I think I would say this for any um, person who's full time in their W-2 and they're working their business on the side. You want to make the decision that's right for you at the right time when you are prepared for success. So I know I'm not, I'm not saying don't do it afraid because you still need to do it, but I'm also saying make sure that you have done your due diligence to make sure you're in a place to grow, right? Um, and I think there's a, sometimes there's a shame when people have gone out into entrepreneurship and had to come back into a W-2 and they don't want to talk about it. Listen, um, if I can use Donna McClurk when we fall down, but we get up, whatever the case may be, um, don't be afraid to go out there and do it. Do whatever it is that your heart has, that you feel your heart can, um, has led you to do and that you'll be successful in, but do it with a plan, right? Do it. And then don't be ashamed or embarrassed if you have to go to your W-2. A W-2, as Tina said, it is an honorable resource, right? The key is, um, being able to find a create a plan, a succession plan or a transition plan, as Dave and Fernando talk about, so that you can live your your entrepreneurial dream um, in the best way possible. Absolutely, absolutely. Not just want to add one more thing oh, to sure. that as well. So um, when you trans, like you said, when you're transitioning, or if or you're in a, you're looking at an exit time frame, like right now, I, I actually made some sacrifices financially as well. What I mean by that is where I tighten up my budget to make sure that I put enough funds to the side to grow a surplus, a substantial surplus. And I'm grateful for that, not bragging at all, but you definitely want to uh, start generating a surplus for that emergency money. There will be a dip. And I, and I do understand that there's a small possibility or, or, or not only say small possibility that there will be a dip because in that transition, you know, you, you're going to have to, if, you know, if I transition part-time to the team program, eventually I'm going to have to start picking it up to where I'm doing that full time, um, and and uh, so there will be a small dip, and you want to be you want to make sure that you're able to take care of your you know your responsibilities and things like that. Or before you decide to, to take that that leap of faith, um, maybe to pay some things off first. Maybe sacrifice, cut some costs, take that money, and pay off with you know some of the debts you have out there, whether it be a car loan, whether it be you know uh, a loan that you have out there. You might want to try to take care of those resources to get more surplus. And it could take a little longer, as she said, you know, um, this is my estimated time frame, but I, I'm not going to just jump shit because, you know, I said, OK, the, the last quarter of 2021 or the first quarter of 2022, if, if things doesn't pick up and progress the same way, you know, as I intended to do, then no, I'm not going to just jump my shit, you know, my, 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 uh, my main source of income at that time. But yeah, um, you definitely want to have you want to set yourself up to be in a position where you can create a surplus or some type of emergency savings in case you know, there is a dip uh, or a drastic dip to where you're not scrambling and looking for funds to try to take care of your, your obligations. Yeah. And, and Omar, could I say something? Oh, sure, I sure. don't believe that um, full-time versus part-time is a mindset. You can work full-time for 10 hours a week. You can work part-time for 40 hours a week if you're not engaged, uh, you know, to your job. So everything I do is full-time. Every entrepreneurial endeavor I take on is full-time. And I make myself busy during, throughout the day, 
with Taz to make it a full-time job when it's not. Um, uh, kind of echoing what Fernando said, real estate. We know realtors have to season. People have to trust you. You have to get your name and your face out there. Uh, I, I don't know too many realtors that just hit the ground running, you know? So there's no realtor who starts full-time unless you're getting sent business from some golden egg. Um, but we look at realtors as full-time, uh, as a full-time uh, career, and it is. Some people just don't do it full-time, and it could be the same for any industry. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of folks thinking about it, you can have a full-time job that in your head is part-time but takes up a lot of hours, and you can have a full-time career in entrepreneurship that takes part-time hours. It's, it's really up to your perspective and how you set up your business. I just wanted to add one thing, even though I, I don't have a W-2 anymore, like because I coach on how to exit your job. So um, there was something Fernando said that I really want to explore a little bit. I want to explore a lot of those hidden uh, things that you get that you might forget. Right. Like I teach uh, people about their effective pay rate. So like if you don't want your standard of living to go down when you leave your job to become an entrepreneur, then make sure you understand all of the things that are coming with your job. Sometimes you're only looking at that salary, but what if they're paying health insurance? What if they're, what if you, um, they're contributing to a 401k? What if they're doing all of that? So you want to take all of that in consideration so you know how much money you need to bring in so that you don't dip your standard of living. Uh, as Tanisa said, like, you know, don't be afraid or ashamed if you have to go back to a W-2 in order to, um, do some things. I know some people who work for an airline just so that they can fly for free. They will go and work one day a month, a week or whatever, so that they can get that flight. I also know some people who work a job just so that they can get the benefits so that they can have the health insurance and everything and don't have to take that cost on as an entrepreneur. So really understand what you're you're losing because it is more than just your hourly wage most of the time so that your standard of living doesn't dip when you become an entrepreneur. And Omar, could I just say this, if I could, I think what Tina hit on, if I could just tag on this, is um, something I think we could explore and I don't have to talk about it. Somebody else probably could. But what I heard Tina mention was strategy. And then earlier I heard Dave talk about mindset. And I think it's, the, the marriage of strategy and mindset along with your passion well, or, or, or having your why being bigger than your excuses, right? So it's the, it's the culmination of your strategy, your mindset, and your passion or your why behind what you're doing that I think will really launch people into entrepreneurial success. And I just, I heard her say that and I just felt like it was something that could be just, um, explored a little bit more as to the power of strategy and mindset as you go and consistency, but that's a whole nother topic, right? As you go into your nonprofit, I'm sorry, your for-profit, your entrepreneurial journey. All right. Hey, Dave, I want to ask you something about real estate. Um, when you meet a family and they're buying their first home and, and you help them purchase their first home, how, how does that make you feel seeing them smiling and jumping up for joy? Um, a boyfriend and girlfriend or, or someone just got married or someone been married for 10, 15 years and they're buying their first home. And then my second part of that question is when, when you're looking for a home, what, what is it that that, 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 should, that you should look for? For example, should, should I ride in a particular neighborhood at night uh, during the afternoon and during the day to make sure that's, that's the right neighborhood for, for me to look at? I mean, I'm just using that as an example. Good good questions, Omar. I'll start with, with question part one. Uh, it's very rewarding. And I found that a lot of my clients become lifelong friends. I have client appreciation events and I'll invite people from five years ago and they show up and they're happy to talk about the experience they have. And we know that when someone else speaks about your experience, it's more than you could ever say. Um, so it, it's rewarding to see those families and to see them grow. It's also rewarding to, to meet 
whether it's a single person or a family, meet them and they may have some credit challenges or some financial challenges and to see them get into position to become a strong buyer and then buy a home is, is rewarding, especially if it's a young person or, or someone who has been through it, you know, and just trying to get their life back on track. Uh, so yes, it, it, it's a great experience. And, and those experiences are why I do real estate. When I see the look on kids' faces when mom and dad are showing them the house for the first time or, you know, family and, and, or going to a family reunion or just seeing them on Facebook, living life, posting pictures of the house I sold them. Uh, it, it really makes me, it reminds me of why I do this. Uh, the second part, um, I guess what you're looking for, yeah, you should always ride through a neighborhood a few times, you know, late at night, weekends, so that you understand uh, you know, the neighborhood a little bit more, see it in different times and, and, and different ways. Uh, but secondly, you know, as a buyer, it is a seller's market. Uh, so you really have to be strong. Um, gone right now are the times where the buyer has a lot of negotiation a lot of times. So there's just so much demand for houses and so little inventory that the the whole process is flip-flop. Sellers are saying, if you're not interested, if you're being complicated, even when you're not being complicated, but if you're putting more parts, more moving parts to this deal, I'll just, I'll just find someone else. Uh, houses are going for, you know, on average, I think the National Association of Realtors, don't quote me, I think I read this last month, houses are going on average 25,000 more than what they did two years ago. That mm -hmm. is someone's starting salary somewhat. That's crazy. Um, so I try to educate buyers on what makes you a strong buyer so that you can get what you want. Because, you know, we tend to go and, and rely on the Zillows or different things online or, or talk to folks that we know who aren't professionals and we form our opinions, but it's always good to speak to someone who's in the field uh, all day doing it. Uh, Fernando, you mentioned uh, family business. And one of the things that to me, a family business, I mean, it, it can be a little, a little controversial. This is what I mean. You have a family has a business. One of the family members is not doing well on a job, but then the, the owner or the supervisor, they say, you know, may have an obligation. Well, you know, I know that's my nephew. That's my sister, that's my brother. So I'm gonna let him or her slide. What, 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 what if an argument encounters and, and there's conflict within the family? I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking just, just different things. It could be a conflict of interest at times. Uh, you know, working with family, or, or it could just be a beautiful thing. So uh, what has been your experience working with your father, working with your, your uncle and your brother? Um, have you guys had like differences of opinion whether, whether it's family conflict, whether everything goes smooth? <laughs> oh, of course, you know, you're gonna always have some disagreements. Uh, uh, I can go back to when we when uh, when we started our, uh, our, our venture with Millennium Dynasty Enterprises, it was a promotional, uh, uh, and it was myself, my brother, and my cousin. And, um, you know, we had we had some conflict, uh, uh, more so money part, money part, money, uh, someone not putting putting in their end, uh, or someone is not, uh, you know, coming to the to the event uh, later. We have a set time. We need to set up and do some things, and maybe two people show on time, the other person shows late, and it just put more stress on the other two. Um, so yeah, you know, you, you're definitely going to have some some disagreements, uh, or someone slacking or lacking. So. Um, you know, you just got to get back to the table, sit down with, sit down together, put our heads together and like, listen, you know, we all got to be each other's crutches, but we also got to be, you know, strong and, and committed to this. Uh, lack of commitment obviously uh, was an issue uh, at one point as well. That, hence why, we, you know, we had a, a situation where someone's not committed to bring and put forth their money because we started this business from the ground up. So it was coming out of our pockets until we were able to uh, generate enough income to for it to pay for itself and then eventually pay us. And it did, it did do just that. Um, you know, we did this for about 10, 10 about 10 years. Uh, we, we've done it. So, um, and it was, uh, we did wind up losing my cousin, um, um, like midway through it, he, he dropped off uh, because of his, uh, his lack of commitment. We, uh, it was a tough decision. We had to give him a piece of the pie and let him move on. Then he wanted, you know, he saw that we were still being successful and moving on, just me and my brother doing the advertisement, the marketing and promotions, 
what have you. Then he wanted to get back on. Uh, and, um, you know, we sat back and talked to him. Um, he reinvested into it and um, he actually uh, showed the commitment that we needed to do, uh, that he needed to do to uh, stay back in it. And eventually, you know, uh, we wind up uh, kind of letting it dissolve after, after some of the, some of the um, locations started to, um, to, to, to slow down. But uh, yeah, you know, you just have to keep your head on. I mean, it, it never got to the point where we was pushing and shoving. Uh, it did get a little emotional, um, you know, right. like, you know, come on, man, you know, you, you overcooking my grits here, you know, I'm putting in a little bit more than you, you need to put in mine too, you know, I, I'm, I'm giving every, I'm staying committed to the cause and, you know, you shortchanging, you know, shortchanging us here or, so yeah, sometimes it can get a little, uh, it can get a little, a little, a little shaky with family. A lot of people say money and, you know, don't mix money with family, they don't do family businesses. You hear that a lot and, um, you know, there is some truth to that. And, you know, there's also some committed people, you know, uh, family members who stay committed and, and, and keep that bond tight and, uh, you know, do what they need to do within the business. Right. Okay, uh, Tanisha and Tina, both of you uh, have, won, have um, done educational workshops, seminars on your, your particular um, practices. So I want to start off with, with Tina, then Tanisha. Um, what workshops have you recently done? What workshops and seminars have you recently done, whether it's in person or online? And then do you have any future workshops and seminars? Um, yeah, so I just did one a couple of days ago about um, the six things that every business should automate right off the bat, right? Like even if you're just starting or whatever, these are the things to automate. Um, I, I'm doing a lot about automation right now because I feel that automation is the equalizer. If you want your business to grow, then understanding how to automate your sales and marketing, um, at least pieces of it and parts of the actual client journey will really help you scale your business a lot faster. Um, you know, automation is the cheapest employee that you can ever have. Uh, if, the, if the automation is doing it, you don't have to keep looking over that person's shoulder. Um, uh, a lot of people have reserves because they go, oh, okay, well, how can it be as personal? And there's uh, so many ways that you can continue to make things as personal as it is when you're doing it. But if I can save you as an entrepreneur, if I can save you 10 hours of grunt work that you're doing every week, that's now 10 hours you can put in your sales generating process so your money can go higher. Um, that, that's what I train and teach on most right now. Yep. Okay, Tanisha. So um, last month, I did a workshop on how to start your nonprofit. And actually on Thursday, I'll be doing a workshop on how to raise money for your small nonprofit. So that's um, being held through Eventbrite. And that's when Thursday at 7 p.m. Six, Thursday, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., a two-hour workshop on how to raise money for your small nonprofit. I'm doing that course because I feel that well, the reality is most nonprofits are small nonprofits, meaning their annual revenue is under $500,000. More specifically, I support the, the micro, grassroots, and ultra small nonprofits who have under $250,000 of annual revenue. That's just the um, place that I feel comfortable with. That's my passion. And I realized that fundraising strategies for that group are totally different than for your Girl Scouts, your United Ways, and all those kinds of places. So I'm here to give relevant strategy to help that small nonprofit get the results they need and be successful along their journey. Okay, now Dave, Fernando, I don't want to leave, leave you two out. I don't know if you guys uh, do workshops and seminars and give you opportunity <laughs> to, to say so if you do, if you don't, I'm not sure. Well, I'll go. Um, yeah, as a, as a realtor, you do want to do workshops. I do, uh, I haven't done since pandemic, but I'll do first time home buyer workshops. I'll do first time home seller workshops because some people don't know, you know, what the ins and outs are of, of selling a home. They bought a home and created some equity and they're ready to upgrade and, and don't know what that means or if now is the right time. Um, I also, uh, with the music piece, and again, these are all before pandemic. I don't know how they'll work out 
well, I know they'll, they'll, they'll come back, but they have, they've been on hold for maybe a year and a half uh, with the music piece. I go in and speak at the schools uh, about entrepreneurship and music, you know, and I get folks attention, the kids attention, because I show them pictures with some of their favorite rappers and stars that they see on TV and then they listen. Mm -hmm. um, so th those are just things that I do. And I, I think whether you're for, for profit or nonprofit, there should be an element in your business that impacts the community regardless. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I wouldn't say I do a workshop. Um, I do more of like a, a, a conference call with my team because I, I have uh, I have people, uh, I'll say business partners, anyone who's in my organization, they're a business partner of mine. So I have business partners in Dallas, Texas, and um, uh, uh, Kansas City, New York, um, and uh, Atlanta. So, you know, I, we, what, what I do is I'll call a, a meeting or a call on, on um, co free conference call or a Zoom meeting. And we know we just talk about certain things, making sure everyone's on, on point, uh, following the duplicatable system. We celebrate those people who got, you know, promoted. We also celebrate those people who got maybe, a, you know, a customer or their first customer, things of that nature. So, you know, I'm more, uh, you know, I have to be a leader and I, you know, for those people that are in my organization and, and also, you know, uh, be readily available um, at all times. So, you know, I get calls at 12 o'clock sometime. Hey, you know, I got this person on the line, you know, I'm wiping the cold out my eyes. Let's let's do it. So, uh, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it, uh, it's a good feeling to help other people and help, you know, remind them of their whys and why they're doing this and keep building it. And, you know, some people are, are more obsessive to it. Uh, they, you know, they, they're good with it. And then, you know, you have some people who stay on and fall off for a little while or come back. So, you know, I, I, I we do a lot of uh, on Sundays and Mondays is when we normally have our, our, our meetings. And we also invite new new people like if there's someone that needs more information about the business that one of the, you know, one of my partners had maybe talked to and we'll come on to our walk to our call and we can, you know, we can talk about it at that time as well. So, yeah, we're, you know, we have, uh, have, have meetings where we gather with the network marketing portion of my uh, business. Okay, so before we close out, I'm gonna let all, you, all of you uh, give an opportunity to uh, display your business, as say what your business are, what your hours operation, how can people contact you? But my last question, uh, Atina, is, uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but just, just give us more reasons as to why some businesses out there fail or don't make it. You're on mute. I was, I was getting ready to start talking <laughs> and I realized I was on mute. Um, <laughs> The biggest reason most people fail is they say it's because they're underfunded, but truthfully it's because they don't know how to be creative enough to get the funds in their business that they deserve. And um, that really goes from poor planning and from lack of confidence. And that's why I always start with learn to sell. Um, you should love screaming about your business from the rooftops. You should love to talk about it even if nobody is gonna click a like or comment or any of that nonsense. Like you should really care. Like if you can't, if you wouldn't do it for free, like when you become an entrepreneur, I think you have to be willing to put that grunt work in and to do things for free. Um, and really like not saying you want to work for free, but if you are not all the way in, you're going to be out. Right. Okay. So Tina, you know, I'm going to, um, but anyone else want to say that before we close out? Okay. Everybody else is good. All right. So, so Tina, I'm going to start with you and give you an opportunity to uh, say what your business is once again, and how can people contact you? What's the website? All that good stuff. Sure. So um, I am on every um, social media platform as Tina Brinkley Potts, except for Twitter, which I think is just Tina Potts because they don't have that many left. Um, and uh, you can reach me at my main website, which is tinabrinkleypotts.com. I am right now helping um, business owners with a 30-day uh, challenge to get their business automated. Um, those challenges are free. So um, 
that, you know, inbox me and I can definitely send out the information. Hey, Fernando. Okay. Yeah, I'm on uh, social media, some social media platforms. I'm on Instagram at Eat to Live and Enjoy. You can reach me there. You can reach me on Facebook, Fernando Feliciano. And you can reach me at, on my uh, website at FernandoF.WeConnect, and that's K Y N E C T.com. Also, Malaluka.com, Fernando F slash uh, Delaware. All right, Tanisa. I am on Facebook at tieenterprise.com. Well, Tie Enterprise is my Facebook page as well as my business website. It's tie-enterprise.com. And I also have a group that is complimentary for people who are starting their nonprofits. It's called Nonprofit Startups Success Strategies. And I'm happy to welcome you into that group and give you some ideas and some guidance to support you along your journey. All right, last but not least, Dave. All right, I'm gonna give you two. Let's start with real estate. Uh, Dave Mays, EXP Realty. You can uh, access my website at davemays.exprealty.com. Uh, you can reach me on social media. Dave Mays Realtor is, is Facebook, Instagram, all of that. I have a lot of fun. Uh, like Tina was saying, I have a lot of fun and I get creative with uh, my content. I think... Uh, if, if you go there, you'll see two weeks ago, I was doing an open house and I threw on some Motown and I said, hey, dance party. And just you know, it got a lot of likes for no reason. I did absolutely nothing. It had nothing to do with real estate. But those are the things that make it fun and shows that you care, that you, you, you make it fun for your clients. So that's real estate. Uh, as far as DJing, uh, IconDJs.com is my general website. We uh, provide... Uh, photo booth, lighting, DJ, hosting for weddings, proms, you name it. Uh, everything is at Icon DJs, at I-C-O-N D-J-S. And I mentioned that uh, I have a um, ancillary that is just me. If you want to book me personally, you can go to djamaze.com. Uh, it's all on the back end. That, that website and my Icon site are actually the same, but it looks forward facing a little different. Uh, for the client. So that way I can see who they're trying to reach. So please, you know, Dave Mays Realtor is social media, Icon DJs on social media, and DJ Amaze on social media. On that note, I thank each and every one of you for coming on tonight, being my guest. I mean, it was an awesome show. Thank you. Uh, we got to do this again. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, Good so job, everybody, Omar. Like, all right, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Please like, subscribe, and all right. share. All right, take care, everybody. God bless. Have take a safe care. week. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.